singing, uh, through our praying, uh, through our response uh, to the proclamation of, of God's word. And, and just last night, I was just as I was drifting off to sleep, I was just thinking about as though I could hear the wind uh, and the rain hammering on the, the house, uh, and I was just thinking about the persecuted church, and I just how, how privileged we are to be able to meet in this way, uh, so freely, so publicly. Uh, this morning. We're, we're privileged, aren't we, to be able to sing as loud as we like. Uh, we're privileged uh, to be able to freely hold the Bible in our hands and, and follow along, aren't we, as, as God's Word is, is preached. We're, we're very privileged, aren't we? So let's make the most of those privileges this morning. Just a few notices. We, we have our evening service uh, tonight uh, at 6 p.m. Uh, and Harold's taking that. That'll be a, a sharing service. Um, anyone like to yeah, share? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unless we get another volunteer, I've only had one volunteer, two, one and a half volunteers, could be a long service listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> We're going to see me before we go today. That's, that's possible. Please volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> Um, there isn't really a huge amount of other notices other than um, the Bible study and prayer, my prayer meeting uh, tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. at church. Don't say what that's called. That as well. That's the third chapter in Philippians. If you've been joining us, we've had a great time looking through this incredible book. Next uh, session, in chapter three, and it's called The Bishop of York Meets Kipper the Dog and the Great Strain Robbery. <laughs> <laughs> so, please turn up your final Thanks, Harold. Um, that's, all, that's all the notices. No, no cameo, no baseline, no prime uh, this week. Uh, this, this morning, we have, we have Ray Trainer with us, again from Southport. We're very thankful, Ray, for, for coming and, and sharing with us uh, this morning. And we're, we're going to be thinking a little bit later on when Ray comes to preach um, about God's protection. And as I was as I was preparing just to, to leave this morning, I was reminded of the words of Psalm 18. Uh, just just reminded rem reminded us that God is is the, the great protector, uh, the great defender uh, of His people. And Psalm 18, just the first six verses, we'll read them read them now. And it's a Psalm of David uh, when he was when he was on the run, uh, he was fearing for his life, uh, and this is what he says. Psalm 18, verse 1 to 6. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. The cords of death entangled me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry came before him into his ears. Now, now I, was just, I was just pondering on that psalm just for a few moments the other day. Um, and isn't that just amazing? And that when we, we cry out to God, he always hears our voice. Uh, look, look how God's describing those six verses. Describes our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our refuge, our shield, our salvation, our stronghold, our saviour, uh, and the one who comes to our aid when we call out to him. That's just amazing, isn't it? Let's, let's stand and, and sing 
Our first song, which follows some of those themes from that psalm, uh, as God as our deliverer. So we'll stand and sing strength for his eyes. Father, we, we praise you and we thank you for the way that your word, the Bible, describes you. And we thank you for those verses from Psalm 18. We, we thank you that as your children, as those who have been redeemed by your Son, the Lord Jesus, that you are our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our refuge, our shield, our salvation, our stronghold, our saviour. And we praise you and we thank you that you hear our cries for help and that you always respond in a way that's fitting. That you always respond according to your good and perfect will. And we praise you, Lord, that our, our prayers rise before you like incense. 
that they reach your very throne room. And Father, we thank you that you are not you're not distant and, and far off, but that you're, you're very near, that you are our protector. Thank you that you are a, a very present help in times of trouble. And Lord, we acknowledge now and we give thanks for how you sustain us day by day. And Father, we ask this morning that you would please forgive us for, for the many ways that we have sinned against you, even over the last week. How we've, we've knowingly and unknowingly uh, sinned against you. Father, so often our thoughts uh, and our affections and our desires uh, are so alienated from you. And Father, we, we've acted at times as though, as though we even hate you, even, even though you are uh, the most loveliest of, of beings. And we praise you and we thank you that, uh, that your patience has not run out on us. But there's free grace that flows from the cross of the Lord Jesus. But Lord, may we may we not spurn your grace. And may we not trample again uh, your son, the Lord Jesus, underfoot. Uh, please keep us from temptation, we pray, and, and deliver us from evil. Uh, please grow us uh, in holiness, uh, that we be shining lights in a, in a dark world. Uh, Father, that we bring before you uh, this local area, uh, this church here surrounded by, uh, by broken people who desperately need a saviour. Uh, Lord, as, as broken people ourselves, please help us to point our friends and our families uh, and our, our neighbours, our work colleagues uh, to the Lord Jesus in whom salvation is found. Uh, oh, how we long to see this area reached uh, with the good news of the Lord Jesus. We recognise our great need of you. And we pray for those of this fellowship uh, who can't gather with us this morning, but would love to. Uh, please meet them in their homes. Uh, please sustain and strengthen them by your grace, we pray. Uh, and Lord, even as their outer man uh, wastes away, we pray that their inner man may be renewed day by day. Uh, please go with us this morning, we pray. Uh, oh, Holy Spirit, please open up our eyes to the truth of your word. Uh, transform <coughs> us by your truth. Change us, we pray. Uh, in your precious name, we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing again uh, another song, uh, and then... Straight after that, uh, we're going to stay standing uh, while we, we just read a verse of scripture from the New Testament or a few verses from the New Testament before we go on to sing again. So we're going to stand and sing, uh, stay standing, uh, read a few verses from scripture and then uh, sing another song straight after that. So let's stand. <coughs> Yeah. 
verses uh, from the New Testament. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 8 to 11. This is the Lord, uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul speaking. Uh, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, uh, perplexed, but not in despair, uh, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, uh, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. Uh, the Bible, the Bible uh, teaches uh, that the Christian can face the trials of life in a different way to the non-Christian, can't they? Because as Christians, we, we face difficulty with a certain hope, uh, a knowledge that the God who gave his precious son to save us uh, will certainly not abandon us. He won't leave us in the lurch, uh, but he'll finish the work in us that he, that he has begun. So as we sing this next song, please focus on these words from the song. To this I hold, and my shepherd will defend me. Uh, through the deepest valley he will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome, and yet not I, but through Christ and in me. <laughs> Yeah. 
Bible with you. Uh, we're going to open up our Bibles at this point. And we're going to open up to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you're using one of the Bibles in the pews, uh, it's page 374. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 8. Uh, through to verse 23. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, through to verse 23. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such, a, in such and such a place. And the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. And time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aaron. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. And the report came back, he is in Dothan. And then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. And they went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? And the servant asked. Now, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round Elisha. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, Strike these people with blindness. And he struck them with blindness, as, he, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, This is not the road, and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so that they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes, and they looked, and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men that you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them, so that they may eat and drink, and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master, so the bands from Aaron stopped raiding Israel's territory. Let's just pray uh, before the children go down, and uh, before Ray comes up to speak. Heavenly Father, we give thanks uh, for your word. Uh, we, we thank you that it is the truth. Uh, and we pray, Lord, uh, that as Ray brings it to us, uh, that you will enable him in a special way by your Holy Spirit, that you will open our eyes uh, to the truth that are found in it. We pray for the children downstairs uh, and uh, those who are teaching them. Uh, we pray that you give wisdom to those who are teaching uh, and that, Lord, uh, the children would understand the truths of your word. Uh, we pray uh, that the seed of your word would fall on good soil this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. So at this point, the children can go down to junior church, uh, and those who are below primary school age, down to the French, and both of us downstairs, and uh, raise them. Up. Good morning again, everyone. 
Uh, you can have your Bibles if you'd like to turn to that passage. Um, that Sam read to us from 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, we'll refer to one or two of the verses uh, from it um, over the coming minutes. Uh, now, if you have good memories, and I don't expect uh, all of you to have remembered what I spoke on, if you were here two weeks ago, it was on the early verses, the story of the floating axe head, and we looked at God's provision. Uh, next time, God willing, uh, we're going to look at the verses after the story uh, of this morning, and then into chapter 7, and we're going to look at God's deliverance. Uh, but this morning, we're going to look at, from this story, of, uh, we're going to look at God's protection. Now, we live, don't we, in frightening times, particularly, I think, as God's people. We live in frightening times. Indeed, within the West, uh, we actually seem to be catching up, don't we, with the rest of the, the world in this respect. Uh, so what do I mean by that, that we live within frightening times? What do I mean? Well, for example, I read recently that a staggering 76% of the world's population, three quarters, three out of four people in this world live in countries with high restrictions, high restrictions on religious freedoms. Isn't that amazing? Three out of four people in this world. But that restriction of our faith, as experienced by so many uh, across this world, and that restriction is also, I believe, coming to this country too. But we only need to see, don't we, the increasing antagonism to the Christian faith within the media, for example, or the increasing number of immoral laws being passed by our government, or as far as ethics and morality are concerned, in the, in the minds, that is, of the influential and the elite, uh, the Bible is actually considered substandard, isn't it, by many by the chattering classes in our world today. The Bible is considered substandard. Effectively, you see, uh, Christians within this country now stand on the wrong side of the fence. So we live in frightening times as God's people within this world. Indeed, this is exactly what the church has always experienced, down through the centuries and across this world. And the unusual, the unusual bubble of freedom and safety and gospel opportunity which we've enjoyed within this country over the past 300 or so years is exactly that. It's unusual. It's simply not the norm for Christians who live within this world. Now the norm is what Jesus tells us in John 15 verse 19. Jesus says, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world <laughs> hates you. And that's also why we live today, more and more in fact, we live today in frightening times. However, even though that's true, frighteningly true, scarily true, yet the greater truth, to quote uh, Dale Ralph Davis, the greater truth is this. No one is so safe as the people of the Lord, even when they live in the most frightening of times. No one is so safe as the people of the Lord. And that's also precisely what our text for this morning, 2 Kings 6, uh, verses 8 through to 23, that's what this text is actually all about. It's all about God's protection in frightening times. So with that in mind, we have three headings for this morning. Last time I think we had four headings just to break the norm. But we're back to the Lord this morning with three headings. First, God's protection is often extraordinary. 
Second, God's protection is often unseen. And third, God's protection mm. is often unexpected. Extraordinary, unseen, unexpected. So let's look at those three things in turn. Firstly then, God's protection is often extraordinary. And this particular truth can be seen within verses 8 through to 13 of our text, and the first part of our story, uh, which we read out. So what's happening within these few verses? Well, there's much that we don't know, much that we don't know. For example, we don't know who the king of Aram <coughs> actually was. It may have been Ben Haddon II, but we don't know for sure. In fact, we don't actually know who anyone was within this story, except that is for Elisha, who is alone named. And we don't know precisely when this event occurred. <laughs> for the chronology um, of this section of Second Kings is, is actually not at all clear. But what we do know is that this king of Aram, whoever he is, this king of Aram is getting extremely frustrated. Isn't that right? And you, you can imagine the situation, can't you? You can put yourself into the situation. You can, you can imagine this, uh, this king of Aram there in his war room, pouring, so to speak, over his maps with all his army generals around him, when suddenly... Suddenly, his frustration finally erupts. He simply had enough, hasn't he? So he thumps the table and he yells out, Will somebody just tell me who's giving the king of Israel all my secret plans? Can you imagine if that is? Of course, someone does know. Perhaps it was someone lower down in the ranks, maybe. And how that officer actually does know is another good question, really. But he really does know. And so he tells this king of Aram that his problem is Elisha, God's prophet in Israel. That's his problem. You see, this king of Aram's problem was not a mole within his own inner circle of generals. No, this Mola is somehow supplying military secrets to Israel. No, it's not a traitor, so to speak. No, it's Elisha. It's God's prophet in Israel who has this, this inside track, as it were, into all of the king of Aram, all that the king of Aram decides to do. It's Elisha. Second Kings 6, verse 12. None of us, my lord the king, says one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. And so again and again, whatever is decided by the king of Aram and his army generals against Israel, as we see in verse 8, again and again it comes to Elisha. Again, we see in verse 9. And it's then passed on to the king of Israel for him to counter. Verse 10. Again and again it happens. Whatever is decided. In other words, God protects his people in an unusual way, in an extraordinary manner, from the aggression of their enemies. Of course, the specific protection by God here of his people through Elisha, knowing exactly what the king of Aram decides within his own bedroom, this protection is unusual, isn't it? It's, it's extraordinary. But God is truly able, and God is not at all beyond using the extraordinary when needs arise. For God's timing is always perfect, and God always knows what his people need, what needs to be done for his people. And God will use even the extraordinary, if it's needed. 
God will use even the extraordinary in order to protect his people from their enemies. And that's a real encouragement, isn't it, for us too today. A real encouragement for God is in control. God is not surprised. And God will use whatever needs to be used, even the extraordinary, in order to bring to fruition his purposes and his plans for this world and for his people. God protects his people often, often in an extraordinary way. In the 1970s, many Christians in China <coughs> were worshipping, as they still do in fact, they were worshipping in house churches. Indeed, their meeting places were constantly being changed in order to avoid persecution. <laughs> the leaders would be arrested, wouldn't they? And they'd be sent to labour camps, so they kept moving around to avoid uh, this persecution. But the, at the end of, of, of one meeting, when those present had particularly had a particularly strong sense of Jesus Christ's love and of the Holy Spirit's presence with them, at the end of that meeting, five visitors visitors stood up. They they announced those five men announced that they had been sent to make arrests. However, now. They too wanted to believe in Jesus Christ. In other words, in a most unusual way, God had disarmed the very plans of their enemy. In an extraordinary way. God had protected his people and brought others into his kingdom. In an extraordinary way. Of course, God doesn't always work in this way. But what we do know is that we're truly under God's protection. For no one, no one, no one can touch or harm God's people unless God himself allows it. Or in the words of Psalm 124, verse 8, our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In Psalm 125, verse 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. <coughs> Whatever happens, we're in God's hands. Second, let's consider the next truth. That God's protection is often unseen. It's often unseen. In fact, we see this specifically within verses uh, 14 to, uh, through to 17 of, of 2 Kings chapter 6. Now again, we can imagine the scene, can't we? We can picture the scene in our minds. I'm sure we can do that. In fact, we see this, uh, in fact, this, rather, this scene, it's, it's a rather comical scene. If truth be told, it's quite a funny scene, isn't it? Now here's Elisha's servant, whoever he is, and one morning he steps outside the front door uh, of their home, he and Elisha's home, uh, in order to pick up the newspaper or to bring in the milk or whatever it is that he's about to do, when suddenly he espies this massive and fearful enemy army surrounding the city of Dothan. And of course their own house within that <coughs> city. It's a massive army, isn't it? it? It's fearful. It's a strong force, including horses and chariots, no less. So no wonder this servant scurries back in through the front door with his tail between his legs, as it were. And yells out to Elisha in verse 15, Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? Makes a smile, doesn't it? It's quite humorous, really. Now, then notice Elisha's response. Notice what Elisha does, in fact, do. For there are two things, there are two things, notice, 
that Elisha does. Two things. First, in verse 16, this is an amazing verse. In verse 16, Elisha states the truth. He states the reality. He states the big fact which we, as God's people, which we always need to understand and believe. So what's that big fact? What is it? What's that truth? What's that reality? Verse 16. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that glorious? And that's truly, truly the truth. For we never, ever need to be afraid, even though we do live in frightening times. We never, ever need to be afraid. Why? Because those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Indeed, the Apostle John knew this same truth too, didn't he? Uh, but what does he write in 1 John 4, verse 4? You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. It's the same truth, isn't it? And of course, Jesus, the Son of God, who he knew the reality of this too, of course he did. For when Jesus is being arrested, what does he say to Peter? In Matthew 26, verse 53. Do you think I cannot call on my Father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? That's about 72,000 powerful and mighty angels ready and willing to come instantly to Jesus' defence. Of course, those 12 legions of angels were not actually called upon to come and rescue Jesus from arrest. Why is that? Well, because Jesus' death was the will of God for him and for this world. But Jesus didn't lack the resources, did he? No, he didn't. Of course he didn't. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, knowing this truth in our heads is one thing, <coughs> but being gripped by it in our hearts and being driven by it in our wills, well, that's another thing, isn't it? For actually seeing, not just hearing, but seeing the reality of this truth It's also vital, isn't it? In other words, not only does Elisha in verse 16 tell his servant this truth, states this truth to him, he also, secondly, and this is the second thing that Elisha does, in verse 17, he secondly, he also prays for his servant that his servant may see and know and understand the certainty and the reality of this truth in his heart, in, in his will. Verse 17, Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round Elisha. Now those, well, they were the Lord's legions, which were on Elisha and his servant's side. <coughs> you see, not only must we know this truth, those who are with us are more than those who are with them, we also need to be held by this truth and gripped by this truth. We mustn't, it, it, it mustn't be just head knowledge, must it? It must be heart knowledge knowledge too. Because sometimes, well, let's be honest, sometimes we find this very, very <coughs> difficult, don't we? Perhaps when we're going through a serious, life-threatening illness, life-changing 
illness. Or perhaps when there's a family breakdown. Or there's marital infidelity. Perhaps there's the prospect of unemployment and debt. Perhaps there's a period of deep depression. For at such times, such, such times, we find it truly difficult, don't we, to believe that those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Well, at those very times, we need to keep on resting, don't we? We need to keep on leaning and to be and to keep on relying upon the glorious truth of verse 16. But we also need to ask our Heavenly Father that he may graciously grant us just a glimpse, just a glimpse perhaps, of the horses and chariots of fire. God's protection is often unseen. Thirdly and finally, God's protection is often unexpected. It's often unexpected. This can be seen in the final uh, part of our story, verses 18 through to verse uh, 23 of our text. Now, if the previous two scenes within this story um, the, of the king of Aram losing his <coughs> calm in his war room with his generals, uh, and of the servant of Elisha losing his calm on the doorstep of their house, if those previous two scenes were humorous, well, I would suggest that this final scene is absolutely hilarious. Think about it. It really is. Again, try to imagine the situation. Try to put yourself there in that situation, in the, sh in the shoes of these soldiers of the King of Aram. For this strong force, these soldiers and these horses and these chariots of the King of Aram, well, they come down, don't they, in order to capture Elisha, God's prophet. But Elisha prays. For a second time, notice, Elisha prays and the soldiers are blinded. Now that word for blindness, that used there is translated blindness, that word, uh, that, uh, which, you know, blindness, which these soldiers are overcome by, that word is an unusual word. In fact, it's only used in one other place within the Old Testament. That's back in Genesis 19, verse 11, when the men of Sodom were pressing, weren't they, close uh, to, to the door of Lot's house. And they too were blinded. It's the same word. It's the only other place where this word is used. And that underlying Hebrew word, translated blindness in the NIV, is not so much speaking of an absolute absence of light, totally, totally blind. No. It's speaking really of visual confusion. In other words, these soldiers were befuddled. They couldn't see clear. They, they, were, they were in a fog. They were visually confused. Well, now the humor begins, doesn't it? For the man they were really after, Elisha, God's prophet in Israel, well, he now leads all these soldiers on a long 10 mile hike all the way to Samaria, Israel's capital city. And when they finally get there, Elisha prays again for the third time, and guess what? <clears throat> guess what? They find themselves, these soldiers, these horses of the king of Aram, they find themselves, yes, with Elisha, who they're after, but also surrounded by their enemy. The end of verse 20, then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked, and there they were inside Samaria. Now the king of Israel, possibly King Joram or Jehoram of 2 Kings 3, uh, verse 1, has in mind, well he has in mind a bloodbath, doesn't he? We see that in verse 21. Let's kill them all. However, Elisha gets the king of Israel to give these captured soldiers a banquet instead. Verses 22 and 23. And then he sends them all back home to their families within Aram. So 
a very funny situation, isn't it, with much humour within it? It is. But what is the lesson? <coughs> What's the lesson, particularly for us today, in 21st century Britain? What's the lesson? Well, would you have expected this? Would you? Would you have expected for the enemy to be spared and died and then sent home safely? It's almost unheard of, isn't it? Would you believe it? Would you? For God's protection here of these Aramean soldiers, no less, is unexpected. And the lesson in this unexpected display of God's protection of enemy soldiers, no less, is a lesson of both grace and hope. Again, place yourself in the shoes of those enemy soldiers. How would you have felt? Think about it. How would you have felt when you could suddenly see, when you were no longer <coughs> befuddled and in a fog? How would you have felt? What would you have thought? What would have gone through your mind? For oh no, they were in the middle of Samaria. Oh no, they were surrounded by their enemy. So what do you think they thought at that precise moment in time. Well, I'm sure that they thought that this was the end. I'm sure that they thought that this was curtains for them, for sure. I'm sure that they thought that their time had come. I'm sure that their hope was all gone. And yet, yet, they were spared. They were spared, but God protects them by restraining Israel's king from a bloodbath. And even more than that, they get a banquet too, before they trundle off home to their families. It's truly amazing. I wonder if any of those Aramean soldiers saw the grace of God in this. I wonder. What an, what an opportunity it was for them to do so. I wonder if any of them turned to the God of Israel, just like Nahum and the Aramean commander did in the, in the previous chapter, chapter 5. I wonder. For this protection by God is not only an amazing example of God's grace, it also gives amazing hope to these soldiers. Not just for now, but for the future. For God's grace and God's salvation is available for all, for Israelite and for Aramean. God's grace and God's salvation is available for all, for Jew and for Gentile. Indeed, God's salvation is available for you and for me. Rightly, we expect God's judgment and wrath for our sins. But God in Christ is able to forgive us and willing to forgive us. And we don't face death, but rather blessing and a banquet in heaven with Christ himself one day. God's salvation is available for you and for me. The shelter of God's protection is available for you and for me. And all you need to do to receive that amazing grace and salvation and protection for yourself is turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. All you need to do is look to Jesus' life and death and resurrection alone. For your forgiveness and acceptance with God. And like these Aramean soldiers, which is a picture in a sense, you will know. You will know escape from God's wrath. And you will enjoy the banquet, the blessing <coughs> of being God's child. You see, God is the God of the unexpected, isn't he? 
God is the God of unexpected grace and unexpected salvation and unexpected protection. Well, may he have all the glory. For he is worthy. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this simple story, amusing story, but also a wonderful story of your protection of your people. We thank you that your protection is so often extraordinary. We thank you that it is so often unseen. We do not really understand and see. Help us to see. But we thank you that your protection is unexpected. We deserve, we do not deserve it. We simply deserve your wrath and punishment. But we thank you that your grace is glorious and wonderful. And instead of death, we can know life. We give you our praise and thanks in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> well, let's, I think we're going to stand and sing Christ our hope in life and death.
now and ever we confess Christ, our hope in life and death. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, <coughs> equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen.